It's autumn, my favourite season. Crisp weather, blustery winds, rustling leaves and climate summits. If you're subscribed to the channel, hopefully you will have seen my last video about 2023's COP Climate Summit. And if you haven't, you can check it out up here for a bit of context. Autumn is also the time of year that the annual State of the Cryosphere report is released. And I'm afraid to tell you, it's not great news. But you don't have to take my word for it because I braved the elements to track down someone who knows a lot about the state of the cryosphere and about translating polar science into international climate action. Okay, so hello, my name is Dr. James Kirkham and I'm the Chief Scientific Advisor of the International Cryosphere Climate Initiative. My job is basically to take the science and translate it into policy and tell policymakers why the cryosphere, the frozen parts of the Earth, is so important to decisions made today. Every year to coincide with the COP Climate Summit, James and his colleagues release a report about where we're at with polar environmental change. So this is the report that we're releasing to coincide with COP28. The report doesn't tell us anything we didn't already know, but just like the IPCC reports, it brings together existing knowledge about the polar regions and puts it all in one place. And there's one thing that comes out really clearly. The key message is that two degrees is simply too high for the cryosphere. And this is because it will lock in lots of sea level rise, multiple meters eventually over centuries, lock in emissions from permafrost thaw, which will then make it harder to meet our key climate targets. And also we'll lose massive amounts of water from mountain glaciers and snow, which supply water as a lifeline to billions of people around the world. The cryosphere includes all the world's ice, ice sheets, ice shelves, sea ice, glaciers, snow and permafrost. This report also includes polar oceans because they're so linked. And climate change is having a profound impact on every one of these important parts of the cryosphere. For sea level rise, that two degrees is simply too high. It will lock in multiple meters of sea level rise over the coming centuries. For mountain glaciers and snow, two degrees is too high. We're going to lose half the world's ice at 1.5 and above that much, much worse. This will create massive problems with water, water scarcity. For permafrost, two degrees is too high. 1.5 already now will commit massive amounts of emissions from permafrost and two degrees will be far, far worse, about the same size as the emissions from the EU today, every single year. Polar oceans, two degrees is too high. We're going to cause irreversible damage in terms of acidifying and dissolving the fundamental basis of the food chains there. And for sea ice above anything else, two degrees is too high. Losing sea ice in the Arctic will be like putting a radiator next to the Greenland ice sheet, which will cause massive feedbacks around the world, which will be very, very bad. OK, so it's clear that two degrees of warming would be disastrous for the polar regions. But some of these consequences are already baked in. Cryosphere loss is partly inevitable. That is something we have to settled with as a fact basically so for today's temperatures of 1.2 degrees this will mean that some mountain glaciers will be lost regardless of what we do and if you watch this video up here you'll know that the loss of the west antarctic ice sheet may also be inevitable but james is also concerned about the prospect of exceeding two degrees celsius for another reason this is really concerning especially for permafrost because once you thaw permafrost, the emissions which then come as the matter inside it decomposes, like the organic matter, into methane and carbon dioxide. That will go on for centuries. We can't stop that now. Permafrost is ground, mostly in the Arctic, that is for all intents and purposes permanently frozen. Hence the name permafrost. It's soil that has a load of very carbon-rich organic material frozen inside it so it can't decompose. But when it starts to thaw, all those decomposition processes that were previously on ice can resume, which releases lots of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, including carbon dioxide and methane, the two bad boys of climate change. And it's a bit like throwing a bowling ball. So once you give it a push, it will continue to roll on for a long time because the whole system has momentum. There can be a lot of momentum in the polar system because ice takes a really long time to respond to changes in temperature. And global average warming of two degrees above pre-industrial temperatures means much larger warming over the poles. That's because of a phenomenon called polar amplification that exacerbates warming in the Arctic and Antarctic. But what exactly are we getting ourselves in for if we don't limit warming to less than two degrees C? Let's think about sea level rise. We know from studying evidence over the last many thousands and millions of years that the Greenland and West Antarctic ice sheets can't survive above a certain threshold temperature. And the evidence suggests that the threshold is well below two degrees above pre-industrial levels. 
So long-term warming of 2 degrees C implies their eventual collapse, and if we also factor in losses from glaciers on land, sea level rise of more than 12 meters. Mountain glaciers are another vulnerable part of the cryosphere. At 2 degrees, the Himalayas will lose half of their snow and ice, and almost all mountain glaciers outside of the Arctic, Antarctic, and Himalaya will completely disappear. That means the end of skiing holidays in the Alps or the Rockies, and more importantly, huge impacts for water resources in regions that depend on meltwater for drinking, irrigation, and hydropower. The hotter the temperatures, the quicker that loss will be, and without action, all the glaciers in some regions will be gone as early as 2060. Only the very lowest emission scenario and implausible imaginary future that involves temperatures peaking at 1.6 degrees and then declining to 1.4 by 2100, see slow regrowth in mountain glaciers by the 2100s. We're already seeing dramatic declines in sea ice at both poles, and 2 degrees means an almost annual sea ice-free Arctic Ocean, which will have huge impacts not only on indigenous communities living in the Arctic, but also potentially on weather extremes in the Northern Hemisphere. The loss of sea ice at both ends of the Earth will cause the world's oceans to absorb far more of the sun's energy and accelerate the pace of global average warming. Speaking of oceans, 2 degrees will cause the oceans to become so acidic that many creatures that form a vital part of the polar marine ecosystem will not be able to build their shells. This would have cascades of impacts that travel up the food chain and destabilize important fisheries like cod, salmon, and lobsters that people depend upon for their livelihoods. And for permafrost, two degrees of warming would result in the irreversible emission of huge amounts of additional greenhouse gases that would equate to the present-day emissions of the entire European Union, heating the planet further and amplifying the problem. Two degrees would commit future generations to enormous amounts of negative emissions, on top of the ones that are needed to offset the greenhouse gases we've already put into the planet's atmosphere, oceans, and land. The golden silver lining of this is that the bulk of the impacts from the cryosphere are still preventable. They're not locked in yet. But if we don't act within the next few years with concrete steps to reduce emissions now, which is the only number that ICE really cares about, then it will become irreversible, and this will be extremely damaging for centuries to come. As James says, there's still so much benefit to taking action, which is why it's vital that negotiations at the summit increase our global ambition for climate action. But the flip side is pretty scary, because we are currently nowhere near on track for two degrees, let alone one and a half. In fact, the UNEP emissions gap report, which is also timed to coincide with COP and has a zinger of a cover image this year, shows that current commitments made at previous climate summits will put us on track for about two and a half degrees of warming by the end of the century. So where is James getting his optimism from? Polar regions provide really inspiring examples of where the science can make a difference to policy. We saw this with the ozone hole, which was discovered many, many years ago now, but then led very quickly to the Montreal Protocol, and that led to fundamental changes in CFCs, and now the ozone hole is recovering slowly. So science can really make a difference to policy. Something we launched last year is Ambition on Melting Ice, and this is a high-level group of countries which are affected by ice loss. These countries work together to place the cryosphere as a central talking point in the negotiations to aim for higher ambition greater emissions reduction, stronger mitigation, and also longer term thinking in terms of adaptation and loss and damage. A massive part of James's work is getting policymakers to agree actions that are in line with the science, a really important undertaking. But that's more complicated than it seems. As a scientist, you think that people in these positions read your papers and they take your findings and they take them into policy. That's not the case at all. You need people in the middle who translate the science into stuff which actually makes sense for the policymakers. Why is it important to them? Why does it matter to their countries? What really matters now is taking that interest and that ambition and really translating it into concrete measures to address the problem. And for the cryosphere, that means mitigation, reducing our CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere. Ambition is great, and the fact that so many nations have signed up to increase their ambition is even better. But is it enough? We desperately need the people in charge to wake up and realise the clock is running out. The message which is not getting through still is that the decisions made in the next few years will commit humanity to impacts from the cryosphere for centuries to come. And this places a huge responsibility on the policymakers of today. 
In many ways, climate negotiations are about damage limitation, because we know that some losses in the polar regions are locked in. But just because we're committed to some changes for the worse doesn't mean that we should give up on trying to make things better. As my pal Climate Adam says, it's never too late to stop punching ourselves in the face. And I always say it, but it's truer for the cryosphere than almost anywhere else. Every tenth of a degree matters. And when you see the stark reality of what's likely to happen at even this supposedly safe level of future warming, it's clear that a lot is riding on negotiations like those happening at COP28. The one thing that does give me confidence is that I've seen firsthand how hard people like James are pushing for action at these summits. It's just that they're really up against it. Putting the state of the cryosphere together was quite an eye-opening experience because although you hear many stories about parts of the cryosphere, until you put them all together, you don't really see how worrying the picture really is. The central message though is that many of the impacts uh, are locked in now, but they'll be far, far worse if we miss these really critical climate targets. I also hate leaving you on a downer and I'm trying to think more about how I can be courageous in the face of this kind of info. So I asked James if there's anything in this report that we can take courage from. The biggest one we can take courage from is that simply if we can act and we can act now, we can still meet 1.5, it's still feasible. Not doing that is a political choice. If we can meet 1.5 degrees, many of the world's glaciers will stabilise and even some will regrow by the end of this century. The regrowth of snow and glaciers will be one of the first visible signs actually acting on climate change has a visible and positive impact. In other words, there's a world to win. So get out there, lobby some policymakers and politicians, do something in your own life or local area and help to make climate action even more of a reality. And if you want to learn more about the cryosphere, check out my polar science playlist up here. It was really inspiring to talk to James, who's already done some brilliant work to influence policymakers at the highest level, and to hear that there's still scope to shift the needle on some of the biggest, scariest losses in the cryosphere. James is going to try and update us live and direct from COP28, so make sure you're subscribed if you want to hear how the negotiations are going from the ground. And in the meantime, if you want to hear more from him, head over to my Patreon to watch the full interview I recorded for free. And while you're there, of course, you can also sign up as a subscriber to support the channel and help me make more videos like this. Till next time.